longest and the shortest and some books that only have one chapter. Now we've got the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119. It has 176 verses. The shortest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 117. It has two verses. <coughs> Very short. The longest verse in your Bible is Esther 8, verse 9. I would read it to you, but we don't have that kind of time. <coughs> Esther chapter 8, verse 9. The shortest verse in the Bible is John 11, 35. The longest is Esther 8, 9. The shortest, John 11, 35. Did anybody quote John 11, 35? Jesus, Jesus Yes, he did. John 11, 35, the shortest book in your Bible. Good. The longest word, <laughs> it's a tie. Do any of you know a word that has 18 letters in it? Never Almost. <laughs> Ready? Maher Shalal Hashbaz. I'm not going to spell it for you because I don't have that kind of time. Maher Shalal Hashbaz. That one costs about 50 bucks. And then there's another one, Jonathan Rechokim. I don't know. What I can tell you is Maher Shalal Hashbaz is a picture of the Antichrist, and he has 18 letters in his name. Interesting. Where is that the Bible? Maher Shalal Hashbaz is in Isaiah. Uh, I think I had it. I had it written down somewhere. I'll mark it down and I'll look it up at the end. Is that okay? <clears throat> Maher Shalal Hashbaz. They're both men. That's both the name of a man. Uh, the shortest words in the Bible, there's three of them, that are only one letter. I, O, and A. I love Those are three letters that make their own words. Those are just interesting little things. Here's where it gets really interesting. God is in the King James Bible. The King James Bible is the Word of God. You say, how do you know? I know for a lot of reasons. One of them is there are these crazy coincidences all throughout the numbering and the lettering and the wording of the King James Bible. We're going to look at some middles. The middle words of the Bible. Now, you'll find other people say different ones. They're wrong because they guessed. I'm telling you, based on actual count of the Bible, the middle words of the Bible are... God of. That doesn't make any sense. Well, scoot it out one more word on either side. The middle words in your Bible are the God of Israel. Pretty interesting. That's found in Psalm 59, 5, which says, Thou therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. Selah. You know what that verse is about? The second coming of Jesus Christ. The middle words in the Bible are about the second coming of Jesus Christ. That should tell you something. The middle words of the Old Testament are in 1 Chronicles 21, 21, where it says, And as David came to Ornan, David is a picture of Jesus Christ, the king. Ornan is a servant in Israel. As David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. That is a picture of the Jews bowing to Jesus Christ at the second coming. The middle words of the Old Testament are about the second coming. The middle words of the New Testament are in Acts 8.20 where it says, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Right there is your picture of a man at the great white throne being cast into hell and told your money won't get you to heaven buddy it's about the second coming of jesus christ the middle verses of the bible are psalm 103 1 and 2 they are about guess what the second coming of jesus christ i'll read this this is interesting psalm 103 1 says bless the lord O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name bless the lord O my soul and forget not all his benefits and then it goes on to say, what are the benefits? The benefits are all the things that you and I get at the second coming of Jesus Christ. You want to hear something really interesting about the middle verse of the Bible? So it's an even number. You don't, if you have a group that's an even number, there's no middle one, right? If you've got six people, you say, who's the middle child? You say, there, there isn't a middle. We're the two middle kids. In the Bible, it's an even number of verses. So there are two middle verses. It's Psalm 103, 1 and 2. Start from Psalm 1, 1, and you count verse by verse all the way to Psalm 103, 1. Guess which number verse in the Bible Psalm 103, 1 is in uh, Psalms? 103. Karen? 1611. 
1611. Psalm 103, 1, the middle verse in your Bible is the 1611th word or verse in Psalms. David. But, you know, only crazy people believe in the King James Bible. Right? <laughs> The middle verse of the Old Testament, the middle verse is 2 Chronicles 18.30. That's by counting the number of verses. 2 Chronicles 18.30, which says, Now the king of Syria, the picture of the Antichrist, had commanded the captains and the chariots that were with him, saying, Fight ye not with small or great, save only with the king of Israel. There's your picture of the Antichrist telling the armies of the nations to fight with Jesus Christ. Second coming. The middle verse of the New Testament is Acts 7-7, 7, 7, which says, And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage I, will I judge, said God, and after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. The second coming. The middle verses, the middle words of the Old Testament, of the New Testament, of the Bible, it's all about the moment Jesus Christ comes back onto this earth to take vengeance on the heathen and to redeem Israel. The second coming of Jesus Christ is the main theme of your Bible. Amen. How is the Bible divided? So we know that 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible is written with divisions in it. Now right here, I'm not going to tell you that there's an exact number of divisions. Men have written books trying to nail down exactly what the divisions are. I'm just going to give you eight major divisions that there are throughout the Bible so that we can have a timeline to work with while we study. So when you read a verse like Jesus wept, you can know where that verse fits in on the timeline. When you read a verse anywhere in the Bible, to rightly divide it, you have to take that verse and find out where it fits in God's timeline. Does that make sense? Rightly dividing is taking a verse and finding out doctrinally where does this verse fit in God's timeline. Is that verse talking about the millennium, or is it talking about Jews on the earth while Jesus was here? In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, the Bible says, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Do you and I have to repent and be baptized to have our sins forgiven? No. We don't have to repent and be baptized. We have to believe on Jesus, right? But Acts 2 38 says, repent and be baptized. It's not doctrinally for you. I'm going to rightly divide that verse and put it where it belongs, which is the Jews who had killed the Messiah right after Jesus rose from the dead. Rightly dividing is taking a verse, putting it where it belongs in the timeline. So eight major divisions in your Bible. And I've got kind of a chart here to help you. I'm no master. This is not the final authority. This is just to help you understand a little more about how the Bible works. Uh, the first major division you're going to have Genesis chapters 1 through 3. And I'll go ahead and write these down. We'll, uh, I'll put this over here where you guys can see. And this. So first, you're going to have Genesis 1 through 3. That's going to be the Garden of Eden, and that's going to be Adam. Genesis 3, man falls. The next, you're going to have Genesis 4 through 12. In Genesis 4 through 12, you're going to have Noah, the great flood. You're going to have the Tower of Babel. You're going to have Abraham. We come to Abraham, and God starts changing how he deals with men. God gave Adam a simple rule of the tree in the middle of the garden, thou may not eat. Uh, excuse me, that's not the correct wording, but he was told you're not allowed to eat of that tree in the garden. Noah was given a different rule. He said, God wanted Noah to build an ark and to go into it with his family. That's not what he's told you and me to do. God gave Adam different rules than he gave Noah, and God gave Abraham different rules. Genesis 13 through Exodus 19. Genesis 13 through Exodus 19 is going to be Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the Jews going into Egypt, <laughs> I saw so many confused faces, and now I see why. Exodus 19. <clears throat> That's where you're going to have Abraham. In Genesis 13 through Exodus 19, this is how the seed that was first promised in Genesis 3.15. You remember Genesis 
God gave Eve a promise. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, he said, And I will put enmity between thee, that's the devil, the serpent, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So a seed was promised to Eve in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And with Abraham, God makes it clear that the seed is going to come through him. And then he gives it to his son, Isaac. And then he gives it to his son, Jacob. And then Jacob has 12 sons, and uh, the son Judah gets the inheritance there. And Judah is the one who the seed will go through. And you'll notice, I'll read these off to you, Satan obviously does not want this seed to come around. Because Satan was told, this seed is going to bruise thy head. So Satan, who doesn't want the seed to show up, tries to kill that seed and mess up that seed any way he can. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 8, he had Cain kill Abel, trying to mess up the seed. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 2, he had angels come down and try to pervert the seed of all mankind uh, by sleeping with women and having children that were a combination of angels and women. In Genesis chapter 16, 3, he, uh, we have, I want to read that one to you. Genesis 16, 3, we've got Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. We've got Sarah, who was impatient, making Abram have a baby with his with her servant. Trying to Satan is using her to try to mess up the seed, the promised seed. In Genesis chapter 27, verse 41. Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. Satan put it in Esau's heart to kill Jacob. Why? Because God planned to use Jacob to pass on the seed. Satan is after the seed. Can you see it? It's all throughout the Old Testament. In uh, Exodus 1, Pharaoh had all the Hebrew babies killed, all the Hebrew boys killed. Satan was trying to take care of that seed. In Numbers chapter 25, verse 1 through 3, uh, God, Satan was trying to get the Jews to intermingle with another race of people that God did not want the seed to come from. Satan was trying to pervert the seed. You can see it very clearly throughout that, uh, throughout these <clears throat> different time periods, Satan and God are fighting against each other. God I like to imagine is sitting there on his throne kind of grinning and letting Satan try his very best to fight and Satan's just doing the best he can while God thinks, all right, you, I'm going to let you win that little battle and feel good about yourself. I'm going to let you win that little battle and feel good about yourself, all knowing your time's coming. Your time's coming. Next, we've got Exodus chapter 20 through Matthew 26. Exodus 20 through Matthew 26. In Exodus 20, something important shows up. Does anybody know what it is? The Ten Commandments, the law. God gives the law to Moses. Things change. Abraham was told to do a couple things, but they weren't given the law. In Exodus chapter 20, the law was given to Israel. And uh, the way that God dealt with them was very different than the way that he dealt with um, Adam or Noah or even Abram. I said 26, right? Through that time period, you have Moses, you have the law, you have all the prophets. And they were in effect from Moses until John the Baptist. We'll see that later as well. That law was done away with at Calvary, according to Galatians 3.13. Next, we've got Matthew 26 through Acts 2. This is a transition period. That's going to be a transition period. That is when the apostles are going around doing miracles and showing signs, trying to evangelize the Jews. That's going to be very early Acts. And uh, some of the promises that God gives, like in Mark 16, he commands the apostles to go out. And when they preach the gospel, signs and wonders would show themselves. And people could be bitten by serpents and survive <coughs> it. And uh, they could do miracles. They could heal people, things like that. That's a different dispensation. That's a different time period than what you and I are in. The next, 
the one you and I are familiar with, Acts chapter 3 to Revelation 4. Now I want to remind you, this is not fast and hard lines. This is not, you can't say in Acts chapter 3 the church began. I'm just giving you a general outline of when these times were. Acts chapter 3 to Revelation chapter 4 is your church age. You and I find ourselves in that group. We were born in uh, 1900 or 2000, some of you, and we are at the end of that church age. What's coming next? The next age is going to be Revelation chapters 5 through 19 that we've been studying with pastor for since we've been at church. <laughs> Revelation 5 through 19. That's going to be the Great Tribulation. My handwriting is something else. The Great Tribulation. After the Great Tribulation, at the end there, you're going to have the second coming of Jesus Christ in Revelation 19. And then in Revelation 20 to 22, you've got the Millennium, you've got the Great White Throne Judgment, and we go on into <clears throat> eternity. Or the ages of ages, some people call it. The division of the Bible helps you see... I told you guys on Wednesday, I spoke with a man who was telling me that I had to repent, I had to be baptized, and I had to keep good works up in order to earn my way to heaven. He was telling me if I stopped doing good works, I would die and go to hell. He had plenty of scripture to back up what he was telling me. You know what the problem was? All the scripture he was using belonged here or belonged here. I'm sorry, not there. Belonged here or belonged here about being baptized. Some of the Jews in Acts chapter 2 had to be baptized in order to go to heaven. You and I don't. You and I can never see water a day in our lives and still go to heaven. You know why? Because in the church age, you're saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Any other verse that says otherwise is not going to fit in the church age. Right. That's rightly dividing the word of truth. The reason that Pentecostals disagree with you and me is because they think that Acts 2 is for the church. The reason free will Baptists believe they can lose their salvation is because they believe that tribulation doctrine applies to the church. They think that you have to keep your works all the way until the end, or you'll die and go to hell. If you rightly divide the word of truth, you'll save yourself a lot of heartache and sleepless nights wondering if your works were good enough to get you into heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Those are major divisions of the Bible, and uh, we'll look here at this timeline that I've got. This is just a picture. This is kind of the divisions of how the books divide out. Here is going to be our big timeline of Bible history. So one, I've got a big circle that represents the world, and I've got the number seven on there. What do you think that's going to represent at the very beginning? Seven days. Seven days. Seven days. Creation is what we're dealing with. We've got creation there at the beginning. And I'm going to write this here, and I'm planning to leave this board up here to reference as we go back and forth because all these events that we're talking about here have some of them have thousands of verses about them and it'll be really nice to be able to read a verse while we're studying in Genesis and say now that goes right there and you'll be able to understand a little better in the timeline where things go next we've got a tree what do you think that's about right Adam and Eve in the garden the fall of man next we've got a rain cloud and some water the flood. flood. Good. Who was associated with the flood? Noah. We've got Noah and the great flood. You notice something about God. When he tells a story, he doesn't just say, this thing's going to happen. He connects a man to it. God deals with men. God deals through men. The Bible is a history about men. The best man being Jesus Christ. You know why God cares about men? Because God cares about his son, who's a man. Yep. This whole book is a history of Jesus Christ. Noah and the flood. Next this is weird right here. Brother Winfred, what's something small like that that sprouts little leaves? Beg your pardon? What's something small you can put in the ground that sprouts leaves? Oh, seed. A seed. What do you think the seed's about? And I've got some stars up in heaven there. What do you think that's about? Abraham. 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 We've got Abraham. He was promised a seed. He said his seed was going to be as the stars of heaven for multitude. <coughs> We've got Abraham there. That's Genesis 12. Abraham shows up. Next, we've got two stone tablets. What's that? Moses. That's Moses and the law. Good. Moses and the law. Next, we've got... <laughs> There's an ugly-looking guy wearing a beard who looks like I did about three months ago. I'm still ugly, but I don't have the beard. 
He's holding up a little Bible. They didn't have Bibles back then, I don't think. But he's holding up a Bible, and he's saying, Thus saith the Lord. So what do you think he represents? Prophets. All the prophets. That's the prophets. That's going to be Israeli prophets, the Jewish prophets, from Isaiah all the way to Malachi. All those men. Remember the Hosea movie we watched where he got up and he would tell them, Thus saith the Lord. This and this and this. A prophet. We've got the prophets, and the prophets work together with the law. The prophets... Never disagree with the law. Keep those two together. The law and the prophets are brothers. Moses represents the law. Elijah is the prophet who represents all the prophets. You'll want to remember that. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. That's probably not going to be on a quiz, but you'll want to remember it anyway because it comes up a lot in the Bible. The prophets. Then I've got a number right here. Only the people up close will be able to read it. What's that number? 400. Everybody can read it. All right. Four, you got good glasses back there. 400. 400 years took place where God kept his mouth shut. It was a weird thing. God was silent. He didn't give any new revelation from Malachi all the way to Matthew. Between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was a 400-year silence. And then a man showed up who said, Behold the Lamb of God. Who's that? John the Baptist. John the Baptist said, Behold... The Lamb of God. Luke chapter 16, verse 16 says, The law and the prophets were until John. The law and the prophets were until John. So John was the end of the prophets. John the Baptist. We go to Unity Grove, what church? Baptist. Baptist church. That does not mean that John the Baptist was a part of a Baptist association. That means John, that means John baptized people. <laughs> John the Baptist. Next. So there's your Old Testament. I've cut it off. I stopped it right there because the law and the prophets were until John. After that, you've got a cross. Who's that right there? Jesus. Jesus Christ. And right here, we've got a body. A body. You and I are in this body. Whose body is it? Whose body are you and I in? Christ. Jesus Christ. There we go. <laughs> By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Starting to get concerned about you guys. <laughs> what body are you in? <laughs> By one body are we all baptized. I'm sorry. By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. The church. This is Jesus Christ's body. The Bible says Jesus is the head. And I've got a little picture here. I've never seen anyone draw it like this. I'm going to explain it to you why I did it this way. Jesus Christ is going to come down. He's going to meet us in the air. He didn't touch the ground. He's going to meet us in the air and bring us up to heaven at the end of the church age. That's why I've got that little arrow drawn like that. All right? Next, I've got this horrific PG-13 image right here. You know what it is? Sword. It's a sword. What's it got on it? Blood. That's the tribulation. That's God dipping his sword down into the earth. And that picture is given all throughout the Old Testament prophets that the tribulation is going to be God plunging his sword down into the earth, taking his wrath on men. And I've got Jesus Christ's sword coming down and it touches the earth. That's going to be the end of the tribulation. So the sword is your tribulation. I'm going to put the translation right here of the church. That's the tribulation. And then this right here is when uh, Jesus Christ comes back. We'll call that the second coming. That's when Jesus Christ comes riding on a white horse with armies behind him when you and I are with him coming down to take vengeance on the earth. Next, I've got right there. What is it, Brother Lynn? Crown. That's a crown. It's got some jewels on it. There's nothing special about those jewels. It should probably be 12. I just put some things on there to show it's a crown. This represents what? Millennium. A kingdom. A king of kings reigning during the millennium. We'll call it the thousand years. We'll call it the thousand year kingdom of Jesus. The one thousand year kingdom. Is the earth perfect during the thousand years? No. Are all men perfect during the thousand years? No. A lot of them turn on Jesus at the end. They get fooled, beguiled by Satan. The millennium is when the UN finally gets its way. We have world peace. You know why? Because the harshest dictator you've ever seen will be on the throne in Jerusalem, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. You say, dictators are all evil. Not that one. Yeah, that's right. He rules with a rod of iron. A rod of iron. 
My parents spanked me growing up. They never used a rod of iron. That's pretty harsh. At the end of the millennium, we're going to have something right here in Revelation 20. What do you think that is? That is a throne, and it is white, and it is great. Not the art, but the throne definitely is. And I put a little thing right here because in Revelation 4, it says God's throne has light around it like an, a rainbow of emerald. So uh, there you go. There's a little halo of emeralds around it. And that's the great white throne judgment. These are major events. You say, why are you pointing out these events, Daniel? Because all throughout the Old Testament prophets and all throughout the Gospels, all throughout Paul's epistles, there will be a verse here and there sneaked into the middle of a sentence or sneaked into the middle of a chapter. You know, one verse might be about Noah and the very next verse could be about John the Baptist. The very next verse could be about the great white throne. And you'll have some verses in the Old Testament where the first half of the verse right. is about Jesus when he was on the earth, and the second half of the verse is about the tribulation. Now it's hard, it is hard work to figure out which is which. It's called studying, and the people who study are called workmen, and we are to rightly divide the word of truth. If you don't understand the whole timeline, you won't know where to put the verse when you come to it. So that's why we need to understand all these major events. The great white throne is in Revelation 20. What's that right there? It's a book. It's the Bible. The books were opened, and another book was opened. At the great white throne, we're going to be judged by a book. The people who are judged are judged by a book. Then after that, I've got a city. It's got 12 foundations. It's got 12 gates. It's a mountain. It's got a river flowing out of a throne. It'll have trees in there. What do you think that is? Yeah. There we go. That's New Jerusalem, which is on the New Earth. It's not New Jersey. It's New <laughs> Jerusalem. <laughs> Good. There, in general, is your Bible. New Jerusalem will take us on out into eternity in the future. Right before creation, we'll take you back to eternity past. Just about any verse in the Bible, you can fit in between one of these events. These events are the major uh, breakdown of how the Bible is written, how it's broken down, how history went. And who can tell me how many years all of history will be? No, nope, that's what Charles Darwin likes to say. <laughs> How many years? Thousand. We've taught this before. Seven. Seven thousand. thousand. Seven thousand years of world history. Seven thousand years of world history. The first few thousand are taken care of in the first <coughs> few chapters of Genesis. Noah shows up 1,600 years after Adam. 1,652 years after Adam was born, made, after Adam was made, the flood comes. 1,600 years right there. Then Abraham shows up uh, several hundred years after Noah. Then Moses, the prophets, the temple in the Old Testament was finished 1,000 years before Christ. So there's a, a break. Several thousand years happened right here. Most of world history happens in the Old Testament. 4,000 years happen in the Old Testament, 2,000 years happen in the New Testament, 3,000 years, sorry, 3,000 years happen in the New Testament. In the New Testament, we've got Jesus, the church, you and me, that's going to last 2,000 years from the time Jesus died, around AD 30, till about 2030, give or take 10, 15, 20 years, I don't know, somewhere around 2,000 AD, Jesus Christ comes back, and according to my watch, we're about 22 years late. <laughs> That's a joke, but really, Jesus Christ is coming back soon. You know why? Because this age, its time clock has run out. The sand is almost out of that time dial. It's almost done. Next, the tribulation is only seven years, and the millennium is 1,000 full years. Right there, you've got seven days. Let me ask you a question. In Genesis chapter 1, God did something for six days. What did he do? He created he made the earth, he made the animals, he made the trees, he made the grass. God created in six days. What did he do on the seventh day? He rested. He rested. The earth for 6,000 years is going to be turmoil and sin and judgment and chaos. What happens the 7,000th year? Rest. The earth gets rest. The seven days of creation are a picture of the 7,000 years of world history. 
that's how the Bible's broken up. We will learn a whole lot more. And don't, again, I want to make it really clear, this is not, you don't find this picture in the Bible. It's not in any page in the book. That is just a general timeline to help you understand. And a lot of these break down into more detail. An awful lot of them. You'll find a whole lot more detail on the prophets, definitely. You'll find more detail about the tribulation. Things break up into certain time periods. You'll find lots of different details broken down, but this is the big picture. So that if somebody were to ask you, what is world history going to be like according to the Bible? What does the Bible say? Well, you can take them through these right here. This is what happened through all of world history that God cared to tell us about. This is how it's going to go. And they say, what do I need to do? You need to believe on Jesus Christ before the sword, before that tribulation. We need to believe on Jesus Christ. Everybody should have gotten a handout when you came in. Take out that little sheet. This sheet... You probably have a uh, different version of it in the beginning of your Bible. That's just the list of the books of the Bible. And I've got them written up here if you need them, but I wanted it printed in your hands so you could see. And I wanted you to be able to have it right there so you could see a breakdown of how the Bible uh, is written. So you see the first five books of the Bible are called what? Law. The Law. Now, I've got names on there for all of them, like the Law and History and the Psalms, the Major Prophets and the Minor Prophets. Jesus, in the book of Luke said that the Old Testament is broken down into three things. He said the law and the prophets and the Psalms. But we've broken them down uh, this way because this is how it's written in our Bible and you can understand a little bit about the, what the books are about. So the first five books, Jesus calls them the law. Moses wrote all of those books, except for probably the last chapter in Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus. Genesis is at the beginning. If you want to Say, what, what, where did you come from? What are your genes? That's the beginning. What are your genes? Genesis. It's the beginning of something. That is the beginning of mankind, the beginning of the world, the beginning of creation. That's the beginning of sin. Genesis is the beginning of everything. Exodus. Exodus is a long time after Genesis. Now, Genesis covers thousands of years. Genesis covers from Adam all the way until Joseph and Joseph's death which is several thousand years. Exodus is the Jews exiting Egypt. You remember the story of Joseph, how the Jews were in captivity in Egypt. They had chosen to go there, but things went bad for them while they were there, which is a picture. Everything in the Old Testament is going to be a picture for you and me. In Genesis, the Jews went into captivity in Israel. In Exodus, the Jews come out of Israel. They exit. Who was their leader who led them out of Israel? Moses. Moses. Moses is the man that God called out. That's Exodus. It's all about God giving them the law, helping them around the wilderness a little bit, getting to know the Jews personally, showing them, I am the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. He was establishing a close relationship with the millions of Jews who he brought out of Egypt and back into Canaan, the land where Israel is now. That's Exodus. Leviticus. That's a weird word. We don't use that word today. Um, Jacob, one of Jacob's 12 sons, was named Levi. See how Leviticus starts with the word Levi? Leviticus is about the Levites and the law that they had to follow, the Levitical priesthood. God chose the sons of Levi to be his inheritance. He chose them to be holy priests separated unto him for the Jews. And in Leviticus, we see God's plan and his rules and the way he wants that tabernacle uh, to be administrated and the way that the Levites were to carry themselves in the Old Testament. Next, we've got Numbers. Numbers is all kinds of accounts of history of what happened to the Jews while they were in the wilderness and all kinds of numbers counting the tribes of Israel seven times, all kinds of things you need to know about them. And last, we've got Deuteronomy. That's another word you and I don't use. I use the word numbers a lot. I don't use the word Deuteronomy too often if I'm not talking about the Bible. Actually, I never have unless I was talking about the Bible. Deuteronomy. That breaks down into two different words. Deutero, uh, which just means second. Deutero. And Nami. Anytime you see the word Nami, like astronomy, Nami is the study of astro, heaven. Deuteronomy. Nami actually means law or study, law, whatever. When you try to break down a word and make up the definition, it gets confusing and muddy. What you need to know is in Deuteronomy, God gave the Jews the law again. In Exodus, he gave it to them for the first time. 
In Deuteronomy, a lot of things happened, but mainly God was telling Moses, give them the law again. Say it again. Say it again, because they're going to forget, they're going to rebel, and I want them to know that I gave it to them twice. They had no excuse. They should know what they ought to do, what they ought to do. That's the law. At the end of Deuteronomy, Moses dies. At the end of Genesis, Joseph died. At the end of Deuteronomy, Moses died. That's the law. That's the history of the Jews, where they came from, all the way up to Adam, all the way down to Moses, where they came from, what they did, how they came into Canaan land. And then Moses dies. And we have next the book of Joshua. What happens in Joshua? Joshua is the man who took over for Moses, and the Jews started to conquer the land of Canaan. God had promised it to them, and in Joshua, they go in and start fighting for the land of Canaan. That's the first book that we call the books of history. See, 12 books right there are all about the history of Israel. Joshua, Judges, you know that word. Ruth is a lady's name. It's a short little <coughs> book with four chapters. 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel are about a prophet named Samuel and the kings of Israel. Saul, David, and then Solomon. And the history of what those kings did, their acts, the wars that they had, the things they collected, the wealth that they got for Israel. It's history. Now, Brother Lynn says, I love history. I've met a whole lot of people, and I would imagine some of you would say, I don't like history. <laughs> history class wasn't always that exciting for everybody. I love history. You say, why did God write so many books? He wrote 12 books. In the books of First and Second Chronicles, he wrote thousands of names, just lists of name after name after name after name. You say, why would God care to write so much about those names? Well, this is the people that he chose to be called by his name. He loved them, and he wanted their names written down. <coughs> Second, Jesus Christ, God's Son, is the object of God's affection. God loves his Son, Jesus Christ, and he wanted to make sure that Jesus Christ's history was written down in stone. He wanted to make sure that we had the history of where Jesus came from. Plus, there are all kinds of stories in there that apply to you and me and help us to be better Christians. That's the books of history. They end over there with Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Now here's where it gets a little tricky. Up till now, from Genesis all the way down to 1st and 2nd Samuel, everything's in order. There are a couple chapters here and there in order, but in general, the books are chronological. They took place one after the other. Once you hit 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings, you have some overlap. 1st Kings will talk about things that 1st Samuel talked about. 1st Chronicles will go back and talk about things that 1st uh, Samuel talked about. Then Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther are in order, but then... At the end of the books of history there, we go way out of order. Job is way before, I believe, Moses. Job was a really old book about a really long time ago. Psalms was written in the time of David. So we jumped back to David's time, even though at that time, David was long dead. Uh, we've got Proverbs written by Solomon. Ecclesiastes written by Solomon. Song of Solomon. Those are all, some people call them the poetry books, because it's filled with a lot of the Hebrew poetry, the songs, the psalms that they would write, that they would sing, that they would memorize, and those are uh, what we call the Psalms, and they're not in any chronological order. They're not in a timeline order. After that, we've got the major prophets. Here's where it gets really confusing. The major prophets and the minor prophets, all those prophets, they're all over the place in timeline. One can be talking during the reign of Zedekiah, which was way after David. One can be talking during the reign of David. One can be talking around Samuel's time. Another one can be talking uh, while they're in captivity, like Daniel, while they're in captivity under Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. The, old, uh, the, the major prophets and the minor prophets in timeline go all over the place. And you just have to look book by book and rightly divide to see where they belong in the timeline. So we'll go through those in a little more detail. You'll see the major prophets. There's five of them. And we call them the major prophets because they're long books. That's the only reason we call them major. They're not more important than the minor prophets. They were just bigger, longer books. Isaiah is the first major prophet. He has 66 chapters. How many books are in the Bible? 66 books in the Bible. There are 66 chapters in Isaiah. Isaiah we call the mini Bible. The Old Testament has 39 chapters, and then it changes. It's in the New Testament, and there's 27. 
In Isaiah, you go 39 chapters, and there's a huge change in how Isaiah is written. And the next 27 chapters are totally different, more about the future. <coughs> Isaiah is like a little mini Bible. God gave him a really cool revelation. You say, why would God do that? So that when Catholics tell you there's an Apocrypha and you should have 70-some books in your Bible, you say, no, Isaiah has 66, my Bible has 66, and they're broken down the same. That's just another proof that God gave you the book he wanted you to have. Pretty cool. Jeremiah, we call him the weeping prophet. Jeremiah's life was terrible. Just about any prophet's life was pretty awful. It was terrible. You remember Hosea. I wouldn't want to be in Hosea's shoes. You wouldn't want to be in Jeremiah's shoes. You definitely wouldn't want to be in Ezekiel's filthy shoes. That man had to eat dung. Daniel, he was all right. He got promoted, but he lost his family at the very beginning. All of his friends and family got murdered, except for a few. He got carried into captivity and never got to live in the homeland where he longed to be his whole life. Those are the major prophets. The minor prophets, they're not less important, they're just shorter books. Hosea, I think, has 14 <coughs> chapters. Joel has four. Amos has, I think, nine. Obadiah has one. Jonah has four. Micah has six or eight. Nahum, they're, they're smaller, shorter. Nahum has two. Habakkuk has three. I think Zephaniah has three. They're shorter books, and those prophets all fit somewhere in the timeline of Israel's history, from David all the way to Jeconiah, from their first king to their last king. And we'll learn all about those. I'm sorry, Saul to Jeconiah. Malachi, obviously, is the last book in the Old Testament. That's going to wrap up the Jewish prophecies. That's the very last thing. And it ends, interesting, Malachi ends with a prophecy of John the Baptist. And then you go to the New Testament, who's the guy that shows up? John the Baptist. So the Bible's all very well tied together. It's not a confusing book. If you read it through several times, it'll start to become clear to you. And uh, it's a very, very wonderful, exciting book. The way God laid out the Bible is a miracle in itself. In the New Testament, we've got the Gospels that we call them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's four different accounts of Jesus Christ's life. There are some silly people, and a pastor, I think, has said he heard this, and I've met somebody who believes this. It's wild. They believe that Matthew happened, and Jesus died, and he rose again. And then in Luke, he came back to life. He reincarnated. And he died at the end of Luke the second time and rose again. And then he reincarnated in Mark, same thing, died and rose again, and then in John. No, we call that uh, stupid. And it's not true. It's four different stories of Jesus' life told by four different men. And I bet you can guess their names. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Every one of those was an apostle except for Luke. And Luke spent his whole life around apostles. So they knew Jesus Christ. They had seen him from the beginning, saw his miracles. They saw him die. After that, we've got Acts. The Bible is called the Acts of the Apostle. In the Bible, it's called the Acts of the Apostles, or in the, the title of your Bible, probably. Some people call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. All it is is the history of the Apostles from Peter to Paul. It's 28 chapters long. It's a long book. It's written by Luke, the same Luke who wrote the book of Luke. They're both very long books. 28 chapters in Acts. It's a history of the church, the beginning of the church, and how it went down. In the book of Acts you'll find a lot of heresy. In Acts chapter 2, you'll find out you need to be baptized to be saved. Uh, in other places, you'll find out you need to repent to be saved, as opposed to believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts is not a doctrinal book for the church. It's a history of where the church came from. It's a history of where the church came from. Next, the next group, we've got Paul's epistles. How many Pauline epistles are there? Thirteen. Thirteen. It must be, Brother Winfred. There's thirteen of them. Romans. Good. Was written to the people who lived at where? Rome. Good. Corinthians. Both of them were written to people at Corinth. Galatians. Ephesians. Philippians. Colossians. First and Second Thessalonians. First and Second Timothy. Oh my goodness! I have put Second Timothy. Second Timothy. Is it that way on yours? Yeah. I just want to remind you one more time. I think I've said it six times. Seven is perfect. Ready? I'm stupid. <laughs> 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy. You can cross that out, fix it. See, the Holy Spirit's your teacher. I'm not. If I were your teacher, you'd all have no hope. 1st <laughs> Timothy, 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Paul wrote 13 epistles. That is where we're going to get our meat and doctrine for the church. They're not long books. Romans and 1st Corinthians are pretty long. The rest of them are pretty short. Before we graduate from Growing Grace, we're going to go through every word of Paul's epistles because that is what God wants the church to know. Amen. 
God wants us to know the words of those books. After that, I call these the transitional epistles. These are epistles written to people. This was uh, Hebrews. Paul, I believe, wrote Hebrews to the Jews. And then James. James wrote it to the Jews. First Peter and Second Peter. You say, why do you call these transitional epistles? Why don't you call them epistles for tribulation saints only? Because in First and Second Peter, and in Hebrews and in James, and in First and Second and Third John, there are things that definitely doctrinally apply to the church. They go back and forth. In uh, Peter, Peter even specifically mentions me and Paul wrote about the same things, and Paul wrote a lot about this same thing in his epistles. And uh, so Peter mentions Paul and says our doctrine is a lot the same in this epistle. So you can find a lot of church doctrine in Hebrews through Revelation, but you can't take every verse in there for the church. That's why we call it transitional, because it's a transition from the church to the tribulation. And obviously at the end there, we've got Revelation, which is the history of the church at the beginning. In Revelation chapters 2 and 3, it gives church history, the history of how the 2,000 years of the church age will go. And then in uh, Revelation 4, the church gets caught up into heaven and we're celebrating with God, we're rejoicing, worshiping him around the throne. And then in Revelation 6 through Revelation 19, it is God's wrath poured out on the earth in the great tribulation. And things happen really fast. In Revelation, more than 2,000 years of history happen, I believe. <clears throat> I'm sorry, more than 1,000 years, obviously. We've got the 1,000-year reign, the seven-year tribulation. We've got 2,000 years of church history. And then eternity future. The Bible wraps up with Revelation. The Bible begins in Genesis with a garden with a tree in it. At the end, we've got that tree with a river. That same tree shows up at the end in Revelation. In the beginning, we've got Adam, who's made a king over the earth. In the last, we've got the second Adam in Revelation, who's made the king over the earth. The Bible is one big, beautiful, complete circle from start to finish. It is pure. You know what's amazing? We showed it earlier. There are 790,868 words and they're not just nonsense. If you read uh, the Koran, a lot of the words in there are just like a guy complaining to himself like a sorry little three-year-old. Makes no sense. It's confusing. It's purposeless words. There is not one word in this book that is without purpose. And not one of them is untrue. Right. Every single one of them is good for doctrine. First, for doctrine. So... While we study and we learn to rightly divide, first we're going to see what is the doctrinal meaning of the verse. Second, every word in this King James Bible is good for reproof. Getting on to you. Reproof. Telling you you're wrong. Telling you need to get, you need to get right. It's good for correction. <laughs> Not only does it tell you you're wrong, it tells you correction. Here's how you need to change. Here's what you need to fix, Daniel. Every single word in this book is good for that. Every single word is good for instruction in righteousness. How can I be more righteous? How can I learn more about the righteousness of Jesus Christ? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You say, why, Daniel, do we need the Bible? That book is huge. I know it's huge. Every word in it is good for you. That's why we need the Bible. God wrote us a perfect book. We ought to love it. We ought to love it. I wrote a book on this poster. Here's how we'll close tonight. That was our very first lesson in our class, The Bible Believer and His Bible. That was an introduction to the King James Bible. Welcome. I hope you love it. I hope you knew most of that already. If you didn't, I hope you learned it, and I hope you remember it. We've got a poster here that uh, will be a theme in our class. Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Amen. We started off last week by teaching you that you cannot understand if God doesn't open your eyes. Right. There it is right there. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I'm going to ask you a favor, and then I'm going to give you the quiz questions for next week. First, I'm going to ask you a favor. This is a favor that I'm asking. Please do it. When you come in, maybe when you're in your car before you come in here, I don't want you to think about Daniel, and I don't really want you to think about yourself. I don't want you to think about my ability to teach. I don't want you to think about your ability to learn and study. What I want you to do when you come to class to help get your heart settled, I want you to pray that verse to God. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. It would not hurt you to pray that. That's Psalm 119, verse 18. 
Now, I know you'll forget sometimes. I'm just telling you, that would be a good thing to do. That would be a very good thing to do. That's a good thing to do before you come to class. That's a good thing to do before a preacher starts preaching at church. That's a good thing to do before you set your Bible on your kitchen table at home and start reading it. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. That's Psalm 119 verse 18. I'm going to leave that up in here because that should always be our heart. We can't understand a word of it unless God opens our eyes. Amen. All right. We're going to have a quiz. This one's a little more simple. Question one next week. Here's a quiz. You're going to want to know how many books there are in the Bible. There are 66. You can go back and put a star next to it where you already wrote it or whatever you think. First question is going to be how many books are in the Bible? 66. How about the Old Testament? 39. New Testament? 27. Good. Question number two. This one's a little harder. You've got your sheet of the Bible right here. In order. Name and correctly spell the first 17 books of the Bible. 17, you say, that's a lot. Well, 17 words is not that much. I just said 17 words in the last 10 seconds. 17 books, that's gonna be Genesis through Esther. All right, so the law and history. And Miss Esther, you've already got a jump start on spelling that one. That's perfect. Some of the hard ones in there, Chronicles might be a little hard, Deuteronomy, Leviticus. Make sure you study them. Maybe once a day before you go to bed, write them out. Just write them out and take note of the ones and see how long it takes you to get to where you can write them all out. You say, why do I need to do that, Daniel? If you don't know this book, you're in trouble. Right. We need to learn the books of the Bible. Amen. There's only 66. You know more than 66 words about horse racing, probably. <laughs> learn 66 words about the Bible. You already know some of them. So we're going to do the law and history, the first 17 books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, so on, all the way down to Esther. That was question number two. Question number three. Uh, quote or write, word for word, Psalm 119, verse 18. That's it. Psalm 119, verse 18. There will only be three questions. How many books are in the Bible? In order, name the first 17 books. Spell them right. Three, quote Psalm 119, verse 18. All right. Finally, in conclusion, does anybody have any questions about all that? I told you I'm going to try to learn to be a better teacher. I have just realized that I didn't provide any time for questions and answers about any of this. If you got questions, write them down, bring them to me next week. I will become a better teacher and I will open up time for questions in between the classes. Why? Why? Why, Daniel, would you care about the number of words in the Bible? It took me some time to figure out how many words there were in the Bible, even with the help of computers. Say, so why would it matter? Because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. In Luke 4.4, 4, it's every word of God. In Matthew 4.4, 4, it's every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every word matters. I want to keep tabs. I want to know every single word in that book. Why does it matter, Daniel? Because this is the thing that you and I live by. Every word. Every word. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this book. Thank you for teaching it to us. I pray that you'll help us to understand. This was a lot of information tonight, God, and it was a lot of numbers. And I pray that you'll boil it all down and help it to seep down into the soil of our hearts, help us to understand it, to meditate on the truths of your word and all the verses that we heard tonight. And I pray that you'll help us while we try to come and study your word, God. We want to come with humility and we want to come with total dependence and trust on you. you we, none of us are able to do this without you. And I ask God that you'll help us. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hey, Amen. Just a couple Amen. announcements. If you would